right yeah. so what happens you know uh, yeah. so uh, these msme it's it, uh, there are so many uh, small medium enterprises sometimes the volume by uh, you know at which they are applying for a loan in various commercial banks the commercial banks cannot do the due diligence you know to understand okay how good this uh, you know particular company is doing in order to disperse them certain amount of loan right so if we fit the digital currency you know and we were talking about the programmable payments as well right so those those the smart contracts would get you know implemented and the disbursement could happen real time and at the end of the day the banks will be able to do better risk pro profiling as well of the customers and then uh, the offline payments right so offline payments you know with the help of uh, uh, various wallets we can do the payments so same thing digital currency can also you know uh, find its application in online offline payments so uh, so we have seen right like uh, why cbdc is relevant now and where do uh, where where all do we find its application so let us see so this is like kind of assessment right we will try to understand what is it and then how can i get it implemented and where all i can get it implemented so now the next thing is okay i have done my assessment but i have i need to act on that assessment as well right so that is where this indian uh, pilot of uh, of cbdc comes into the picture so when we talk about the retail uh, part of it right so it it was launched in december 2022 which is current month it is launched in four major cities mumbai delhi bangalore bhubaneswar this is just a pilot okay more uh, cities will be onboarded and uh, four banks which are SBI, ICICI, Yes Bank, IDFC First Bank. So more and the, as I was saying, it's a pilot. More banks could be onboarded once this pilot is successful. And uh, kind of transactions supported will be, you know, peer to peer or, you know, peer to any other bank as well. And when we talk about the wholesale program, right? So wholesale program is when, when we talk about retail, it's more like, you know, business to consumer or consumer to consumer. But when we talk about wholesale, it is like, you know, transactions happening between uh, uh, two, uh, two banks. That is how we could uh, try to understand it now. So, you know, if, if, uh, even the wholesale program which was launched uh, in last month, November 2022, and it was mostly to settle the secondary market transactions in government securities. So these are the, you know, uh, two pilot programs which are running and, you know, within a few months time, they will assess the, you know, success of this uh, pilot program. And that is where we will see the adoption of the digital currency, which is, you know, the latest offering from RPI as well across India. So just to summarize right like what we understood what is happening around us uh, when we talk about digital currencies and uh, you know the I, at the end of the day if you can we can visualize digital currency as you know it's a latest product in the fintech domain like fintech is the most rapidly developing sector now like uh, uh, so what we see okay cbdc is a middle ground okay it is it is try to you know, balance pros and cons between uh, paper money and the cryptocurrencies. It is, it is, it will be built on, you know, some of the principles or, you know, the blockchain framework. So it has to be secured faster and transparent. And it will be because, you know, uh, blockchain is kind of sort of proven technology now. Third one is ease of transactions and settlements. Yes, uh, the digital currency transactions will happen much faster. The settlements will happen much faster. Faster, it could be near real time as well. And yes, once we have assessed the uh, pilot program and it is implemented, this implementation of uh, the pilot as well as the bigger program by the Indian governments or RBI, right? It is going to bring on all the partners right and when we talk about this partner of the digital currency ecosystem we saw that you know this is uh rbi 
commercial banks, payment service providers, and at the end of the day, customers like you and me. So all these partners, they, you know, these uh, IT companies will have to enable, they will have to come up with the solution, they will have to come up with the frameworks, platform, products, in order to, uh, for customers to adopt to this new technology. So that is where Indian IT companies have, you know, a good opportunity wherein, you know, uh, they could develop a new product or offer services around this digital currency. So uh, with this, uh, I would like to conclude this session and I hope it was, you know, helpful in order uh, for uh, those who have joined to understand what is CBDC and where we are headed with it. Uh, so, and that was the sole purpose uh, of this session by me. So thank you, thank you all for joining. If you have any questions, you may you know drop them in the uh, uh, comment box. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Dhananjay. And uh, thank you for the presentation. And next we have is uh, Ashwat Govindan. He will be speaking on debugging Hyperledger fabric chain code. So Ashwat uh, is a co-founder of Spydra Technologies and they are do they are building decentralization as a service for business, which is need of the hour. So people, uh, many enterprises are looking for few APIs they can integrate and uh, done up with the uh, blockchain. So that is a very interesting service he's trying to build and uh, he's an IITN and uh, he, he has worked in Microsoft for 16 plus years and last four years predominantly in blockchain. And he has extensive experience uh, in blockchain and security and identity. Okay, Ashwat, yeah, thanks for joining. Uh, you can start the presentation. Thank you, Karthik. And uh, thank you, Dhananjay, for the overview on CBDC and how it applies to the Indian context specifically. I think that was very, very helpful. Um, so um, this next session, let me uh, share my screen first. Yeah, uh, please let me know once you're able to see. Yes, we are able to see. Yeah. Um, so this next session, I'm actually going to talk about, um, you know, how do you debug uh, code, chain code that you write for Hyperledger Fabric? Um, so as um, uh, Karthik was mentioning, I work for Spydra um, and we are basically uh, developing a lot of uh, use cases and solutions on top of uh, Hyperledger Fabric, where you know we are offering um, asset tokenization as a solution, um, creating um, you know token engine as a solution, which means creating ERC compliant tokens on top of Hyperledger Fabric and all that, right? So uh, all of this requires quite a lot of cho chain code to be written, right? At the end of the day, and uh, when we started this journey, right, we were actually struggling with uh, rapidly developing and testing chain code as a developer, right? As a developer, um, you know, um, typically what you would uh, expect is that um, as soon as I write code, right, I should be able to test. And if you think about how development works in any typical language, right, Java or C Sharp and uh, Node.js, you can basically debug from within the IDE itself, right? Uh, so that part was what we felt was a bit missing. And this session is basically talking about that and our experience in, in uh, trying out the various options available out there currently, which I'll talk about first. And then I'll, I'll come to a, a Visual Studio Code extension that we have written uh, specifically to solve this challenge for ourselves first, because we were literally you know, uh, struggling with it. And then we have basically made it open source so that uh, the community can also take advantage of that. So I'll, I'll talk about that also towards the end. So that's that's how this uh, session will be structured. So basically, um, you know, what are what are the typical challenges, right? So as a developer, if I, if I have to write chain code, right? First of all, uh, irrespective of whichever ID I'm using to, or uh, whichever language I'm using to write, chain code in, I'll have to set up a, a fabric environment first, right? Uh, of course, there are, you know, uh, different uh, easy ways to do that. But still, as a, you know, every time that I need to write code, I need to set up a, a or, you know, at least start a, a fabric environment. Then the second fundamental challenge is that um, unlike, you know, typical code, right, where you can change something and 
test immediately in in fabric you would basically need to uh, upgrade the chain code right which basically means uh, executing the chain code lifecycle commands multiple commands out there and then deploy it and then you'll the chain code will be executed and then you'll get the result right um, so and then there's no in inbuilt capabilities in fabric itself which can integrate with a, with any ide as such right and then make that experience uh, a bit easier so so fundamentally you know developing in a very iterative manner and testing your code as you write is is fundamentally the challenge that that is there right now uh, what are the current approaches the very simplest one is to start logging messages right which which probably everyone has done i i, I also started with that initially right uh, if you want to know what what went wrong you basically spit out messages if there are if else conditions loops you start spitting out messages inside each of these and then you then you see when the code runs where it breaks right uh, of course that's very cumbersome you have to run it then see what where it where it could the problem could be change the code deploy it run it again right pretty pretty uh, very slow process uh, hyperledger itself has a mode called called dev mode which is actually useful in real time debugging and i'll talk about that a bit in a bit more um, but fundamentally you know it is it is supported by hyperledger itself out of the box and uh, uh, but it still requires as a developer for you to set up a fabric network tweak some configurations in the fabric network to run it in dev mode and uh, unfortunately there's no easy uh, as easy as setting up a fabric test network right in, in in docker that is you know you can do that with a single single command uh, unlike that this is a little bit more involved than that so that's you know something that as a developer you'll have to first do and then you know get into the debug mode um with starting with uh, the newer versions of uh, uh, fabric specifically 2.4 and above uh, there is the new chain code as a service model which is fundamentally not really related to debugging or you know development as such it's mainly meant to run uh, to provide an option where you can run chain code um yourself right typically earlier um, it's the uh, peer or hyperledger fabric environment itself which which used to run the chain code or take that responsibility of uh, running the chain code in a docker container or whatnot uh, but now you can basically run the chain code yourself which uh, has its own use cases uh, but then that can also be used as a way to basically uh, do do runtime debugging uh, which also i'll talk about how that works but again here uh, as a developer you are, you still need to set up a uh, set up a fabric network and then you know do some configurations to enable that debugging and then you know then it works but again you know, it, it's not a it's not a very simple experience as in just going to the id and pressing f5 to debug right and starting up um, IBM had a blockchain ex extension, uh, which is, you know, open source as well. Um, however, you know, for variety of reasons, um, it actually does not work anymore with uh, Fabric versions 2.0 2 uh, oh and above. So uh, IBM apparently uses uh, Microfab environment, which, uh, which Microfab as a container, which uh, is slightly different from the regular uh regular fabric uh, fabric uh, nodes as such and uh, so essentially any code that you that require that you've written which uh, requires features which are available in fabric 2.1 above and if you want to test it that effectively cannot be done uh, in a debug mode using the ibm uh, block blockchain extension anymore so um so let's delve into some of these uh, uh, quickly to see how how these work. Uh, so the fabric dev mode, right? So the, how how do you set up fabric in a dev mode is actually extensively documented uh, on the Hyperledger document documentation itself. Um, so essentially, what it does is it allows you to start chain code without installing it on the peer. So normally you would install the chain code on the peer and then you know uh, approve and commit chain code on a channel, right? Um, but then in the dev mode, you don't have to install it on the peer. That's the first thing. The second thing is the approval and commit uh, on a channel only needs to be done once. 
So when you change the chain code, right, you don't have to go through those phases of phase of upgrading the chain code, right? That's the fundamental difference, or that's fundamentally what is different. Now, what this means is that, right, um, using this model, you can actually run chain code in your own IDE. Like if you are using Visual Studio Code, I can run chain code within it. Um, approve and commit the chain code on the ledger once. And then whenever you invoke the chain code, instead of the peer node trying to run the chain code on its side, it will send the request to the chain code, which is running in your IDE. And then you can basically set breakpoints and things like that and you know uh, go from there. So a uh, um, couple of things for that are, that's needed to make this work first of all you need to disable tls um, so it doesn't you know uh, the dev mode doesn't uh, work with the, with tls and then uh, you need to use um, solo as the consensus mechanism because uh, raft actually by default requires a tls to be there in and it actually doesn't work without a, a tls so one of the other um consensus algorithm that you can use is solo uh, which is deprecated but still we are here we are talking about debugging and developing right not a production grade network so it's still okay to use in this kind of an environment um so what is different how do you uh, how do you basically uh, start peer in a dev mode so you have to basically uh, add additional parameters like peer chain code dev true while starting the peer before that, of course, we are assuming that TLS is disabled and the consensus algorithm is uh, set to solo uh, rather than raft. And then you approve and chain, uh, sub commit the chain code, right? So let's let's quickly see how this looks. So what I what I have here is uh, I basically have a, a dev mode network already running. Let me just adjust this a bit. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, I've already started in the interest of time, right? I've already started an order and peer in dev mode. Um, so what I'll do is, um, as I said, right after this, so typically um, you would require a order peer and then you would require a channel, which anyway, I've already done pre-created for this particular demo. Um, so what I'll do now is basically, you know, directly approve and commit chain code. So uh, typically, uh, you know, you would, install the chain code first, but that step is not required here, right? So how does my commit approval and commit uh, look like? So this is a single org uh, network. So, you know, I just have to approve for just my org. And uh, while approving the chain code, you can give a chain code name. You can give any name here. It doesn't matter because there is no real chain code actually installed anyway, right? So you, you have to give a chain code uh, name, a version, which again, you can give whatever you want. Uh, you'll need to use these values somewhere else. So, you know, we'll, we'll see that. And then you basically have to give the package ID. Normally, the package ID would be calculated uh, while by, by the peer itself while it's installed. But here, because we are not installing, we just need this to be a unique value. So I'm just using the chain code name uh, and version here, right? So similarly, you know, the, the commit uh, commands are similar. So I'll just quickly do this. Yeah, so it seems to have succeeded. Now, uh, the chain code is actually committed, right? But the chain code is not there. So, you know, what next, right? So what, what I've done is I've already opened um, the fabric, uh, the asset uh, chain code, which comes, um, the basic asset chain code, which comes in, in, in uh, as part of fabric samples. So this is that chain code, right? Uh, which, which I have basically opened the go, go version of it. Now, normally if you try to debug this, right? Uh, run and debug, it will basically, you know, just try to debug this like a regular go, go application, right? And it, it wouldn't uh, basically do much. So, uh, in uh, so I'm similar similar methods can be done with any ID, but I'm going to show you how to do it in Visual Studio Code. So in Visual Studio Code, to specify uh, to uh, to specify any debug settings, right? You basically create a launch JSON file, right? So I'll create one for uh, Go here, and uh, it'll come like this, right? But even if I try to debug now, nothing will happen because you know this is just regular Go. Uh, 
environment till this point of time, right? So that is where uh, while starting the chain code, we have to add some additional environment variables and arguments, right? So I'll just add this here and I'll show you what it is. So if, we, if you see one is the chain code name and this has to match the package ID that I specified while committing and approving the chain code. Uh, log level is debug that's just set to for, for additional logging and I have to disable the TLS. Similarly, I have to, uh, not similarly, uh, in addition to the environment variables, while the chain code is being start, started, I have to pass in the peers address. So this is a peer chain code address because the chain code is actually not being deployed or you know run by the peer. So uh, in, this, in this model, I have to tell the uh, chain code when it, when it starts up to connect to the peer on the chain code address so that when a request to this chain for this chain code comes, um, the, the peer should invoke, invoke me, right? Uh, this chain, this code, which is running in visual studio code. Yeah. So with this configuration, once I save it and then I launch um, okay, so this is a Go thing. So uh, launch.json is not a Go file. So I have to select a Go file first and then launch. So as you can see, uh, the console, okay, launch, sorry, something went wrong. Let me just, I think it's probably not saved. Yeah, okay. And... Okay, yeah, sorry, I'm opening the wrong file. So this is the this is the file that has a main method. Uh, so let me try that again. Yeah, so when, you, when I do that, um, it should come up. Uh, now, you know, once it comes up, right, what happens is uh, the moment you submit a particular uh, chain code or transaction, right, the transaction should actually start uh, that that the peer should actually call the chain code which is running here. So, so to see that, what I'll do is I'll put a breakpoint right into, in this case, I'll just put a breakpoint into the, to, at the init ledger method. Yeah. Uh, so how do I invoke a chain, uh, transaction? Just like normally you would do, right? Um, uh, peer chain code invoke, and I'm going to invoke the init ledger function. And one additional thing that I have to do is I have to say, you know, TLS is disabled again, because, you know, again, uh, the dev mode only works with uh, the TLS. So I go to my CLI again and uh, work. And you can see that, you know, something is uh, glowing here. And you can see that it has actually hit the breakpoint, which is running for the code, which is running in my uh, IDE, right? So this is this is basically, and if you look at the look at the context, for example, right, you can actually see uh, the actual data, which is you know, uh, which is uh, which is in the context object here, right? So this is this typical debugging debugging that you see, right? So this is how you can actually debug uh, chain code uh, using the dev mode, yeah. So. Uh, so I'll move on to the next way. Uh, so there are slightly different settings that you'll have to do for Node.js as opposed to Go, uh, as in the arguments that have to be passed, right? So um, again, this is uh, not very well documented, uh, but you, you can actually find this information in multiple places, right? And it's mentioned in this presentation also. Now, the other way of um, debugging chain code is using uh, the new chain code as a service debugging uh, service model, basically. So what is chain code as a service model? It's a, it's a, a way of running, as I said, it's a way of running chain code outside of, uh, outside of the peer all by yourself, right? So uh, typically, you know, if I if I look at this particular chain code, right, the one that I was seeing earlier, uh, you would create a new chain code and you would basically then start it, right? That's how you do. But if it's a chain code as a service model, if I look at an equivalent implementation here, um, so here you would basically instead of starting the chain code uh, directly. Uh, you would basically uh, create a new chain code 
and then use that to create a chain code server and then basically start that server right so so literally you are running a chain code server is fundamentally what the difference is right so you have to implement this you have to use a chain code server type uh, whatever language you are using and then start a chain code server right so now imagine you have started your chain code outside in your own server right how would the peer know um, to connect to you right and send transactions to you wherever you have deployed the chain code once uh, a transaction comes to the peer right so that's where there are two two files which are important there's a connection.json and a metadata.json file right so if i look at this particular code that i was showing you uh, how does those look like right so in the connection.json you basically have to say the address where the peer should send the transaction to so typically in a production environment this will be where the actual chain code is deployed but here what what we can do for debugging purposes is basically if your peer is running in a docker container right and you are code chain code is running in visual studio code as an ide so i just debug similar in a similar way uh, as the dev mode if you debug the chain code server will start the chain code server will start serving requests on a particular port right now that port can be if, if we can hit that port somehow right then the, the request will come to the code which is running in your ide which is visual studio code in this case so that's what we are trying to do here when i run it's on local host and my uh, peer is running in a container. So when, when the peer invokes the chain code, uh, I'm saying, you know, use the doc, doc, Docker uh, internal host, which, which is a way of reaching your local host from the peer should go. So whatever port you specify here, right, that's, uh, that is where the, peer will try to send the request and all that I have to do is to ensure that my chain code server is also started on the same address. So if you can see here, right in the code that I was showing, sorry, uh, in the code that I was showing here, uh, the chain code uh, server address is coming from a environment variable. So in a very similar way, so I'll not do a demo for this uh, in the interest of time, but it's a very similar way, right? You basically tell the uh, chain code, the, the, you basically create a connection file. In this case, you actually have to install something on the peer, but you don't install the entire chain code. You just install a package which con contains two things. You, uh, the package should contain the connection.json file and a metadata.json file, right? Uh, the connection file tells you where the request should be go should go and the metadata tells you additional things like what is the chain code name and type has to be set to this so that the peer knows that this is a chain code as a service uh, model essentially. And then you basically just deploy this package which contains these two files. You, so you install it on the peer, right? And then, you have to uh, approve and commit the chain code only once again, just like the dev mode, you do that only once. So whenever you change the code, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to install anything on the peer. You don't have to approve and commit anything on the peer as such. And then you start the chain code uh, on in the IDE, just like we did earlier. The environment variables are slightly different here. Uh, the ones that I was showing you where you say that where should the server be started and the chain code ID should be, should match the, uh, package ID that you get while installing the package on the uh, peer. So once you do that, right, it's very similar to what I showed you in the dev mode. Uh, whenever you invoke a transaction, you'll start getting it on the chain code, which is running in your uh, in, in Visual Studio code, right? So, uh, so those are the two existing models which are available, right? But again, these are a bit complex, as you can see, right? There are multiple configurations involved and you have to do it and you have to do things in a specific order and all of them have to come together to make it work. So that's where we have basically released an open source plugin. I'll quickly show you how that works, right? And what's the experience with that? So it's, uh, so let me open uh, another, um, uh, chain code in Visual Studio. So this is again, you know, the asset transfer ledger. Uh, so there is a there is a sample called asset transfer ledger in Fabric Sample. So this is that. 
if you see this will the reason i chose this is because this shows you a lot of examples of how to submit different transactions right which we can try out so i've just opened the chain code that's all right nothing else so this is a node.js chain chain code uh, just to show you it can be node.js or go right it can work with both so you open the chain code this is the first time i've done that let's say right so i installed the, the extension also which i have done right now right and you you'll see the hyperledger fabric debugger here so this it's pretty much empty at this point of time but what i'll do is uh, similar to what i was showing you right earlier whenever you want to debug something in visual studio code so this is an extension specifically for visual studio code you basically create a launch file first right so i create a launch file and this is node.js so i create i select node.js first uh, node.js but this is a default node.js configuration right this is not what i really want right i want a configuration which works with Hyperledger Fabric Peer, for example, right? So there is an add configuration button here. If you see, if you click on that, you'll actually see, you know, in the Go section, Go debug fabric chain code. And in the Node.js section, Node.js debug fabric chain code. So I'll say this, because this is Node.js, I'll select that. And when I save it, you'll see that in the debug section, now another option, debug uh, fabric chain, debug chain code has come. So I'll switch to that and then I'll run it, right? That's pretty much it. I create a launch configuration and that to, to use using the UI and run it. And behind the scenes, if you see, it's starting to do something now, right? It's actually it's actually running a Hyperledger Fabric network, uh, similar to the test network that comes with uh, the Hyperledger Fabric samples. And uh, it's basically doing everything that you saw me do manually, right? In the dev mode or the, uh, so the, the extension supports debugging the traditional chain codes as well as chain codes for written for the uh, chain code as a service model. So it's trying to, it's automating all of that process that I, I talked about earlier in a single click literally, right? And now it's 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 up and running, right? So now I can actually hit a breakpoint. I mean, set a breakpoint. Uh, let, let me do that quickly quickly for read asset, right? It's already there. Uh, in read asset, I'll set a breakpoint. But now the next question is how do you how do I submit a transaction, right? I, I can of course go to the go to a you know peer or a, a CLI uh, fabric tools CLI and then submit it. But then again I'll have to set it up first and go there, right? That's where uh, the extension also provides an easy way of submitting transactions right from within Visual Studio Code itself. So you basically create a the way that this works is you create a new file called with a dot fabric extension. You can name it anything right uh, abcd and you can create as many files as you want um, in this right once you create a file this is a json file J array basically so you can have multiple requests you can define multiple requests in it so you can say it's a query i want to query something or i want to invoke a transaction right and then you provide the arguments related to that right pretty much simple uh, so it's a pretty simple json structure so I've, let me just uh, submit this yeah, so as you can see, the breakpoint actually hit, right? I'll remove the breakpoint. I'll just, you know, go forward. So now you'll actually see the result also on the on the right side, right? In this case, it says it's a failure because the asset doesn't exist. All right, so I'll go here. I will invoke a transaction, create transaction, which is creating an asset one. It is successful. Now let me go and uh, query it. And now I can see that you know I get the result, and uh, so this this can now be used to actually submit the transactions also. And because this is in a file format, right? You can basically save it into your repository. And if you have a team of uh, folks working on this, right, you can basically you know then uh, check it into the repository, and others can also use the same uh, query and invoke test samples that you have created essentially. So that's that's pretty much what it is, and uh, there are some additional functionalities which uh, you can explore. Like you know, now if you go, you'll see the it, it has created a single uh, organization network. You can basically start, stop, and manage the network that has been created, or you know, remove it. Uh, you can basically add additional identities, and when you add additional identities, uh, it comes with two out of the box. But you can add additional ones, and then you know you can use them specify in the them in the request whether it's query or invoke and then uh, the chain code will be invoked using those particular identities so yeah um so um so this extension has re really helped us uh, to you know uh, speed up our development cycle uh, 
tremendously and uh, we hope that it will be useful for you as well uh, we have made it open source so we welcome any contributions and you know any features suggestions that you have uh, so feel free to engage uh, with us on the uh, github uh, there's a github um, uh, so if you go to the debugger extension right there's a github link in that uh, which has various ways in which you can engage with us thank you thank you ashwat actually it was a very useful tool for me and uh, probably i will be reaching out to you for for more things on this thank you ashwat it was thank a very you, beautiful Patrick. better um, beautiful presentation and a good demo thank you and uh, moving on so next will be uh, the business of smart contracts by smriti choudhury so smriti is a co-founder of contracto so contracto basically pro, uh, is a particular tool uh, she has developed for uh, fmes and financial people to store the contract and it has uh, many other features uh, uh, digital locally e-signature e-stamping so basically it's a cloud solution so you can take it up um, yeah, and integrate easily so uh welcome smriti and uh yeah you can start your presentation is my screen visible yeah yes shruti Great. So good afternoon, everyone. And I'm Smriti Chaudhary. And today I'm joining from Mumbai. It's a great opportunity to connect with all of you on the fourth anniversary of Hyperledger India chapter. Thank you to the Hyperledger India team and the entire community for this opportunity to discuss blockchain, smart contracts, and why we need them. So before I begin, here's my brief introduction. I have an MBA degree and I've completed the MDP from I'm Lucknow. I'm active in Web3 and I've also been part of several sessions across Mumbai and Bangalore. Last fortnight, I was invited by Algorand Foundation to be a part of their event in Dubai. And indeed a great opportunity to showcase my solution to a global audience. So as we talk about smart contracts, we also need to understand a few underlying concepts contracts have a legal significance across business and law and our smart contracts exist on the chain the challenge is how do we bridge this gap and move from paper contracts to digital and finally to smart contracts so my entire uh, talk is split into three main modules in the first part we will focus on smart contracts and then evaluate why we need smart contracts in the next section, I will talk about a typical setup of a smart contract solution uh, using the model we have implemented. So smart contracts are simply programs stored on a blockchain that run based on user actions or when certain predetermined conditions are met or even when certain events happen. So let me share some examples. Imagine a marketplace like Amazon or a Flipkart. This could have a smart contract running in the background where for every payment made by a buyer, one person, now this is an example I'm giving, 1% marketplace commission can be deducted and transferred 99% to the seller. So this can be uh, further extended where the tax on sale of the item can be deposited to the authorities. And uh, this saves a significant amount of manpower and time it uh, automates the payment transfers and it ensures correctness of reporting and removes the challenges of reconciliations. As this is deployed on the chain, the outcomes and the payment splits are already known to the sellers. This creates trust in the system. So the sellers are not worried about um, unknown deductions. And in the same context, buyers can be given an option to provide ratings, which can uh, then be seen across the two e-commerce uh, websites. As the ratings are decentralized, the seller is not challenged with managing sales on multiple platforms and can focus uh, solely on their work. This is a true power and real world benefits which blockchain smart contracts can deliver. So, 
blockchain smart contracts are of course applicable across multiple industries and what you see here is a snapshot from a, a McKinsey article which shows the comparison across various industries some of these are common such as considering smart contracts in financial services and some of them are easy to imagine applications for loans and insurances however Making contracts is not an easy process. Let's look at some of the main challenges with contracts. First, we consider the contract creation process. This is a very time consuming process and there is no such uh, uh, do it yourself uh, with contracts and getting legal services can also be very costly. Lack of standardization for even some of the basic items such as non-disclosure agreements can uh, makes it very difficult for mainstream use of contracts. Next, there is a challenge of validation, uh, validating the identities of the parties who are uh, signing the contract. Uh, collecting KYC across users is not at all easy. And in many countries, it is also subject to data privacy, processing and retention laws. So moving further, the common contract execution process is not able to handle business requirements such as those of delegation and routing. One of the biggest gaps here is also the fact that signatures cannot be verified in an easy manner. And uh, it depends on centralized uh, certificates issued by the, issue, the authorities and uh, use of document readers such as Adobe, PDF, for example. These are just examples I'm quoting. And the final point here is that these being uh, static documents on paper are stored digitally as soft copies. They cannot even provide basic information on the document or alert the parties on contract expiry dates. If there are financial transactions related to the contract, these have to be done separately. Now let's look at the impact of all of this. As reported by Forrester Research, current processes take as many as 24 days to execute a business contract. Uh, further, uh, EY says that 90% uh, of the people working with contracts cannot find all their contracts when they need it. As a result, businesses lose money. We try to un uh, answer this challenge by using smart contracts, enable collaboration between uh, various parties, integrate integration of uh, KYC signatures, notarizations, and make the process seamless and adaptable to deploy smart contracts on the chain. Now linked to these digital contracts are smart contracts, which are deployed completely on the blockchain. The process is simplified where the marketplace contains smart contracts and dApps like an app store. And these are prepared by the smart contract developers and they provide details into the function and outcomes of the contract. Now with this setup, users can now easily deploy the right contract with just a few clicks. Talking about why smart contracts, COVID has had a significant impact on how businesses and people interact with each other. In many ways, it has accelerated the digitization process and transformed the way people would interact in a typical business environment. Uh, now, this uh, creates an additional requirement of trust and security around documents and also the ability to verify the existence of documents from anywhere in the world. This could be a B2B service contract or even a, a B2C employee contract or any kind of contractor hiring agreement. Now, all of this takes quite a bit of effort. So it's equally important to understand the impact it is going to bring. According to the World Bank, small and medium enterprises represent 90% of the businesses worldwide and using con smart contracts can solve the challenges of contract execution, invoicing and payments uh, using blockchain for this particular segment. Talking about the market opportunities, Asia itself represents a huge potential. And this is important to understand because the technical and development uh, uh, needs to be consumed properly. It makes it viable for all of us to invest time in learning blockchain and hyperledger smart contracts. Considering India alone, there are 63 million small medium businesses who are in need of some form of contract management solution. 
let's look at the structure of a basic uh, contract. Now, as we can see in the right, the entire contract can be divided into six components. The first is the contract metadata, which uh, includes the basic information, type and format of contract, start end dates and renewal time period. In this part, we also consider all the file attachments which are part of the contract. Next, we have the different members or the, uh, we, we can call it the parties to the contract. These are user entities who are already having KYC verified or uh, some, some other form of decentralized identity which can be used to sign the smart contracts. Uh, there are projects within Hyperledger which are a very good fit for uh, on, uh, on chain in identity resolution. Uh, at number three, on the right-hand side, we look at the terms and timeline for the smart contract. And this essentially is a translation of the English contract to code, which is then deployed on the chain. And once this is done, we have a digital contract and an equivalent smart contract deployed on the chain. Similarly, authorization to view and interact with the contract can be managed and with decentralized approach, it also makes it easy to verify the existence of contracts. Ideally, implementation will require a two-tiered structure. This allows managing uh, both contracts, invoicing, and payment protocols with a single blockchain and with a decentralized blockchain infrastructure. Layer 1 handles the basic contract, payment and transfer protocols, identity resolution, and other building blocks. Layer 2 builds on top of the layer 1 and implements complex business logic and automation. For example, consider a house rental smart contract. The layer 1 includes the base contract for two parties, payment settlement for each month's rent payment. The layer 2 includes the auto termination, or uh, we can call it the auto renewal of the entire renewal agreement based on the end dates. This can also include implementation of uh, additional uh, smart clauses such as uh, early termination fees, uh, penalties, payment splits, uh, or, or send the commission uh, to real estate agents. Now, what you see here is a representative model of the tech stack which is utilized. We have both individual and business users working with the application. And uh, you can access the solution via the web application, which is a React.js, Node.js app. The Explorer is an additional service which provides the ability to verify documents and check activity on different accounts and contracts. Uh, this is connected to the middleware, which runs the business logic and interaction between the components. A typical contract workflow is made up of several other smaller modules. Uh, we will see this in the next few slides. Uh, we, have, uh, we have identified several challenges earlier with the contracting process and with the implementation of the smart contract modules. These can be solved across the four areas you see here on the screen. And once implemented, the entire execution looks like this for a system implementation. Each module or a subservice is broken down into smaller microservices and operates on the, uh, they operate on their own with a smaller compute and data service. Individually, they might also inter interface and interact with external third-party services. And once all the parties have signed the contract code or the smart, con uh, smart contract components is deployed on the chain and records are created, which can later be used for verification services. This is how the solution looks like. And uh, if you have, uh, I may be able to show you a very small demo. The first is a dashboard which provides a complete overview of all the documents, actions, and reminders. The next is the document vault, which has all the contracts, the documents, and also the notarization. Uh, the contracts, uh, the smart contracts are created from using these workflows. Now the contracts lead to invoices and financial business activities. The next is the CRM or the business contracts network and it provides a complete contract level reconciliation based on blockchain transactions. 
So to summarize, contracts can be made smarter with the use of Hyperledger blockchain technology and provide a single window solution to business and individual users. Uh, in the next few slides, we will look at a uh, basic few examples of implement where it is implementation. Now, this is an uh, this example is for a freelance service marketplace which uses smart contracts for onboarding, management, and payment automation. This is an example for an automation B two B service and subscription contracts. This is the rentals implementation which we already discussed earlier. And to conclude, contracts are needed in every business domain and industry. It could be from uh, supply chain to real estate and other domains also, thus offering us a huge growth potential. We are, of course, early in this space and we are backed by WeWork Labs, IIT Startups and I am Bangalore NSR Cell programs. So with this, I conclude and I thank you all for being a wonderful audience. Please send me your questions and feedback over email and uh, keep calm and keep building. Thank you. Thank you, Smriti, uh, for the presentation. It was very informative. Um, yeah, with this, we are concluding the virtual meet and uh, we will be breaking out for lunch. So uh, the next session will start at uh, 2 p.m. Thank yeah you. right so yeah right so i think you can join the main room yeah people can join the main room for uh, the uh, next session thank you. So, so I think we have around 40 minutes. Uh, so if anybody want to discuss something, want to introduce, talk to each other, so that we can do till that hour we can maybe break for the lunch. So at 2, at 2 p.m. we have one final discussion talking about the emerging emerging themes in blockchain like the BDC, tokenization, metaverse, and all this stuff. 